Anyone who knows me knows that usually I have a negative opinion on movies. That opinion also is a lot more negative on movies, and I just have a negative opinion in general. <laughs> However, there is one movie that <laughs> praises I will never stop singing. It's a film mentioned uh, often. It's a masterpiece of cinema, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, some people... <laughs> it's the damn Breakfast Club. We know how you feel about the Breakfast Club. <laughs> yeah, it's the Breakfast Club. <laughs> And this week we're talking about coming of age films. This is 21st Century Cinema with Joseph Delavecchia and Ava Carvello. Hello and welcome to 21st Century Cinema, the podcast about film, the film industry, and for once, the positive outlook on beloved movies from the perspective of over here joseph della vecchia hi joe Who is i hello ava and i am ava carvello co-host the two of us you're used to our two voices co-hosting this podcast oh but wait is there is there someone else here i like how you just stole my paragraph in the <laughs> wait, script did I? thank you yeah like i'm supposed to do the introduction and all you're right just, there's no script we improvise this yeah, okay. okay go ahead um, today we're joined by our producer katie carvello ava's sister she's also mm-hmm. here today katie say hi hello you're currently talking to about 50-ish viewers. Shh, don't week. tell them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of damage. It's really um, not, but thank you. Katie is probably the biggest supporter of our podcast. She's been here since day one, watching our microphone levels or struggling with some sort of homework on the side while me and Ava just sit here talking. is our most supportive listener, and that's because physically she is here, where you guys have the option to pause and never listen to us again. She lives here, <laughs> so she doesn't have that option. I actually think one True. time she went to Walmart while we did I one think of these. so, too. Yeah. I also <laughs> would like to point out in this script that it, it just says, Katie says hello in all capital, bolded, and italicized, and the font is enlarged. For where Katie Good. says hello, and that's Good. all she's supposed to say. This is oh, all improvised. That's, that's this is no end. script. Didn't well, you just say this? That's the end of the script, and then it just has a list of movies. Yeah, it has a list of movies we're talking about. Okay. Why are we going to script our opinions, Ava? Okay. I, we never I, script our opinions. I, we never script. Actually, there's no script at all. There's no outline here. We improv the <laughs> entire thing. We're exposing our entire so, operation right now. <laughs> we're talking about coming-of-age movies. Who doesn't love coming-of-age movies? Joe loves them more than anything. Katie loves them, right, Katie? Don't you? Yeah. Your favorite movie of um, all time is a coming of age <clears throat> movie. I'm not yes. a big coming of age movie fan. They're not my I favorite. like them. Are you going to be the Joe of this podcast? <clears throat> perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> Somebody has. I like yeah. them, but I think they're so overdone, stereotypical, cliche, more lacking depth. You know what I mean? There's some good ones that feel genuine, but for the most part, they feel just overproduced, ingenuine, and the same. Do you disagree with me, Joe? Yes, you would not have okay, the stop. genius of fourth wall breaking without Ferris Bueller's Day you Off. you disagree with me, Katie? Uh, no, not really. I mean, like, okay. they're, they're not the best movies. Great. Your favorite movie of all time is a coming-of-age movie. Yeah, but it's not the best genre. <laughs> okay, so there's different... Okay, let's get started. You actually just mentioned Ferris Bueller. Uh, I love... I do love Ferris Bueller, but there's something about it that... I feel like I'm, I always just watch it mindlessly. There is you know a lot of comedy in there and you have to i have to admit that the breaking of the fourth wall was really like monumental for film for it to be like that was the first big time breaking of the fourth wall happened in a movie so like i guess you have to acknowledge the impact it's had on film and film writing it's like a fun movie but it's not like a super good movie you know you know it's not super good it is a super good movie how do you (laughs) what what is bad about ferris bueller's day off to you it's like the, it's like ingenuine. All the characters are like caricatures, which I get is kind of the point. That it's not representative of anyone's real experience. I know movies aren't meant to be. Um, Cameron. Very... The entire character of Cameron is a guy who lives with an emotionally abusive and unavailable father. But it's so it's it's not genuine. That's not how it is. So genuine. It's his no, entire it's, arc. It's his entire arc. There's nothing else. That's it. You know what I mean? Like they're all just kind of surface. Well, level I mean, it ideas. takes over the place of a day. I don't know how many issues you want them to deal with no, in a day. That's what I'm saying. Is that it's more of like a fun movie instead of like a deeper more movie you can think about you don't leave Ferris watching Ferris Bueller and you're not like wow damn I need to think about that I need to really analyze what I just watched that is some it's not like you watch Ferris Bueller and you're stuck thinking on it for the next days that you realize stuff the more times you watch it no you watch it and you have a good time watching it so maybe you watch it again to have a good time again but it's not like 
a great movie you know i feel like you're just doing this to make me mad <sighs> perhaps i am because <laughs> i mention a movie sometimes and you're like mm, nah that's a piece of shit or whatever you know it's katie's nodding her head you can say yes yeah you can yes. talk you're okay. allowed to talk katie this why, don't you, why don't you tell people what you think <sighs> of ferris bueller's day off? you like ferris bueller yeah i think it's I a like good it movie too. i don't know the do you whole... agree with me what? eva let her talk <laughs> <laughs> just, do you agree with me i don't know i like it i think cameron i relate to cameron just his attitude of oh geez man i don't know that's like kind of mean but <laughs> like, I, don't, I mean there isn't really anything to think about but like there doesn't yeah. really have to be for it to be a good movie exactly it's a good enjoyable movie but coming of age films all kind of follow the same archetypes that ferris bueller does where it's overdone maybe ferris bueller is one of my favorite coming of age films which it is actually but in terms of all movies this is kind of a standard that if this is the best coming of age movie. Okay, it's not the best coming of age movie, but it's in, still a very good. If it's one good of my of favorites, movie. then it kind of is representative of how I feel about coming of age. But it's a good movie. I'm not dissing Ferris Bueller. You know, Bueller, Bueller. I had a grade eight teacher. He did that every day. My grade Mr. ten Desiree. math teacher did that. Who, who was your grade ten math teacher? Mr. McGinnis. He would do that. Oh, I don't know he who would that do is. that. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> anyone? Oh, you're tired. It's thirteen. Like. He would do that with all math And you questions. know what? Teachers that do that, they think they're so funny. They do. <laughs> Look at these 14-year-olds. They haven't seen Ferris Bueller. We have. I mean, to be fair, Mr. McGinnis was a hypnotist. Funny. He was pretty funny and pretty cool, but... Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not to diss Mr. <laughs> Mr. McGinnis. McGinnis. Larry McGinnis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Ferris Bueller's Day Off to me. It's a very fun coming-of-age film. Okay, it's Ava, fun. You, 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 it's you, fun. It's really would fun. Would you let me I'm talk? Sorry. Jesus okay, Christ. I'll stop. Um... You're right. It's not a deep, deep movie, and you don't reflect on it. But I do think that there are deep aspects to those characters, and there are very important life lessons. Like, the quote of, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it. Am I allowed to talk now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I do like that quote, and I like a lot of the shots in the Mm -hmm. movie. Do you like the quote that's on my arm, or do you want to insult that one? I don't like the quote that's on your arm. A person should not believe in an ism. He should believe in himself. That's a tattoo that Joe got. I just think that's... For Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I'm not going to diss it, because you have it on your arm forever. I'm not going to... I will diss it. (laughs) Go ahead, Katie. Um... (laughs) Yeah, that, okay. was, that was it. That's that was all she had to say. Whole, that's a whole bit. Maybe I spoke too rashly because the more I think about it, the more I realize that I love Ferris Bueller. But I feel like maybe it's just because I've seen it too many times and everyone overdoes it a bit. And because so many movies have tried to replicate what Ferris Bueller had, that it makes me tired of the tropes mm-hmm. that it created. But the charm and but charisma the original, in that movie. And um, the more I watch it, I kind of start to get a little bit annoyed by Ferris. Aw, I love Matthew Broderick. Yeah, I love Matthew Broderick too, but... You know what I mean, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyways, I think it's a very good movie. It opened up the door it's a lot good. for fourth wall breaking and after credit scenes. And I think it was, um, I would say it really got the ball, mm-hmm. ball, <laughs> the ball rolling for coming of age films, right? It came out a year after The Breakfast Club. There's no uh, way this movie got the ball rolling. Fine, it pushed the ball along. I mean, whatever. We'll get there. <laughs> okay. Do you want to keep going? or Yes, well, we can move on. So oh, next, you want me to say it? Yeah. Uh, pump up the volume from 1990. That's the one with Christian Slater. Uh, for those of you, it's it's still a pretty big movie, but I know not everyone has seen this one. He's, um, I haven't. There's currently actually a musical in the works of it. I was actually, Really? That would actually I, be cool. I was fortunate enough. Um, a few yeah. weeks ago, I was actually able to see a preview of the first act of it. Wow. Yes. Where it, is it? Is that at Sheridan? So Sheridan College every year uh, where I go to school, they put on a festival This where they show off three new upcoming mm. musicals. This is where Come From Away actually first premiered. Yeah, and that's huge. So I went knows. to go in that, and Pump Up the Volume was the third one. It has gone through many rewrites, been many years in the making, and it's still probably going to be a little bit more until it's fully done. Yeah. But I was very fortunate enough to see the first act. The cast is very charming. The songs are great. Oh, great. It's so much fun. And it also offers a little bit of a new, creative, and more yeah. relevant twist. So, with actually, that, that's funny that it's being made into a musical. Because this Christian Slater, it's 1990. Mm-hmm. He's, like, young. He's in his prime here. In 19, I think it was 89, Christian Slater's Heathers came out. Mm-hmm. And they made a musical off of that. That and was a year crazy. A- and good. a year after that, he made this movie. Made Pump Up the Volume. And now they're making a musical. Mm-hmm. But anyways, what it's about is he's a um he's a radio pirate. So he broadcasts his own radio show on top of other people's frequencies. And he's a uh... rude. <laughs> <laughs> and he like 
people love his show and he goes to high school with and it's almost like a secret identity the people he goes to school with they don't know that it's him doing it but they listen to his show and they enjoy it and he uses like a voice what do you call it like a, a voice uh modifier yeah. modifier thank you katie a voice modifier <laughs> so people don't know that it's him so he's kind of getting all this praise from people that are giving him a hard time at school whatever he finds out he gives this big motivational speech coming of age stuff and um yeah the end scene his ending speech is it's just empowering and there and yeah it shows all the people yeah. like listening to it if you want to hear it you can watch the movie or you can just look up pump up the volume speech and you'll did get you it. watch it or did you look up the clip on youtube ava <laughs> i rented it and i didn't watch it oh, i ran out breaks of time. my heart but i watched more than one clip and i read the summary mm-hmm. I, very, I know what the movie's about it's it a seems very good. very good movie yeah i really recommend anyone who wants if you just have an hour and a half watch this movie he's got a bit of the really uh, well the and hannah it's... montana thing going on it's oh my god i can't believe you said that um it's it's a very charming coming of age film it with is. a nice young christian slater and who doesn't love christian slater it, it, t- it checks all the boxes it's heartwarming it's funny it teaches valuable life lessons christian slater isn't it that's another box christian slater is check. not a box on a coming of age film he is for me check <laughs> gosh would you consider heather as a coming of age film in a way some people do some people do um but i i love the movie i don't like the musical that yeah much, but, but some people movie. say it's kind of like an anti coming of age film where it doesn't uh, really yeah. teach lessons it's more like mm-hmm. that that weird kid will kill people yeah exactly <laughs> stay away that's from the weird lesson. kid in a mm-hmm. trench that's coat i call that a lesson you know growing up that's something i learned maybe <laughs> it's a friend that wears a trench coat <laughs> i'm sorry joe's friend that wears a trench coat <laughs> Oh my gosh. But yeah, as pump up the volume, worth your time. Really encourage you to watch it. It's a lot of fun, empowering. And yeah, it's also surprisingly very raunchy for a 90s film. The I don't know if you watched any of it, but <laughs> the 90s are so raunchy. I don't the know 90s, what you're talking about. I think about. the <laughs> entire point of the 90s existing was just who could give less of a shit about everything. I mean True. no more like he tells like very dirty and very descriptive dirty jokes okay well in his, you were that's like the born, point of the 90s you're born 1999 yeah yeah if you ask anyone alive in the 90s properly, i know but no i'm just surprised though for the rating that this movie had and for when it came out just how raunchy it is sure raunchy i don't know about like when it came out okay well we're not when... here to argue about how raunchy the 90s okay, but were i just want to mention like what's it called like revenge of the nerds i don't know if that's 90s but that's really awful and <laughs> I, I haven't seen pump up, pump up the volume but i'm sure it really wasn't that bad i guess it's 1990 so it's like late you know what i mean it's like mm-hmm. but it's right off the heel of the still. 80s it's moving on this is a Animal movie House that i believe just 80s. ava's gonna talk about well, let's want- actually let's talk about the Edge of Seventeen first. Okay, The Edge of Seventeen. I this love this film. This came out in 2016. Haley Seinfeld, Haley Seinfeld, Woody Harrelson. Love Woody Hill. Harrelson. Woody Harrelson, great. It was a TIFF film. Got a little bit of Oscar buzz, not too much, sadly. It was my second favorite film of that year. I absolutely loved it. It was not that good. It was I, fantastic. It was okay. It wasn't so real. What? That movie and was real. And we went real. to the same school? Yes. It was <laughs> not. No, that's not what it's like to be a teenage girl. So I would really like to see... She was a teenage girl with a lot of problems going with on. The a movie lot was of very problems. relevant and yeah. very real. Well, like, I I know teenage girls. I am one. <laughs> <laughs> I am currently... Case, just in case you didn't know. At high school, my friends are also teenage girls. It's just, like, not... It didn't fit the thought process and the way people talked. It didn't feel, it felt forced. It felt like someone who graduated from high school five years ago and was like, I'm going to make a movie about high school. And they had completely forgotten what high school was like and just had very vague ideas of what they remember. Yeah, there was lockers. Uh, Did you even watch this movie? Yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't accurate. Katie was nodding there. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Do you I, agree with me? Yeah, I have uh, this movie. I didn't like it very much. I, it felt like something that a kid in high school wrote as like a last minute English project and just <laughs> handed in. It was yeah. so basic. I don't remember anything from the movie other it's... than that spoiler: the dad dies, and that made me whoa, cry. Whoa, whoa. But spoiler. I, I don't. I said spoiler, but oh. I don't remember anything else. Like the movie was so like, basic. Nothing it was stood out. Good, but like, yeah, it was basic. It just was like if you asked anyone what's high school like, they'd be like. 
You know, um, Mr. Guess. Cristelli loved this movie and thought it was really real. Mr. Cristelli? Mr. Cristelli isn't a teenage girl in <laughs> high school right now. When was Mr. Cristelli in high school? I thought throwing in the opinion of someone that you respected would have helped, but no, um, I respect him, sure. But do I respect his opinion on what it's like to be a teenage girl in high school in 2016? No. No? Okay. No. Um... I'm going to try now to talk about this movie. (laughs) This movie, I felt, was actually really real, okay? Okay. Haley Seinfeld's character, Nadine, she goes through a lot from a young age. She's very quaint. I like her. Like Haley Seinfeld? And the character. Yeah. I like the character. Very headstrong. But she lost her dad, and her dad was the closest thing. She has a very hard relationship with her mom. She only has really one friend. Her brother and her don't really get along. Suddenly, her best friend is sleeping with her brother, and... She tries to accept it and, like, be okay with it, but she really isn't just because of everything going on in her life. Like, her world starts to fall around around her. She's doing impulsive, idiotic things that a teenager would do, and she learns from these mistakes. And then Mm -hmm. she has that teacher that she's close to, the replacement father figure, Woody Harrelson, who's there for her and helps guide her. The movie's just a very simple (laughs) journey about her learning more about life and seeing, like, learning from her mistakes. In the ending is a little too perfect as it is all tied up in a neat little bow at the end, which I don't agree with. I don't think that was a good call. But besides that, that, I think the movie is very real. It's it's just it's <laughs> well it's head. well done. It's well written. It's no. well acted. It was no. a fantastic movie. <laughs> oh no! Wait, can I tell you why we disagree on this movie? Go ahead. Because you like coming of age films. I don't. If you told me describe a coming of age film, what is a standard coming of age film? I'd be like, okay, teenage girl. Maybe she only has one friend. Maybe she doesn't have a lot of luck with the boys. Maybe her dad died, and that was, like, the only person she was close to. Maybe she's having a tough time with her mom. That is literally just the edge of 17. Exactly. Yeah, the other movies on this list, check any of those because boxes. Because they're more unique, but if you ask me... Oh God, this movie was unique. It was oh, its own thing. Fine, it I'll be basic. more generic. It was so basic. Someone's having a rough time. The person close to them dies or gets out of the picture. What do they do? They find someone to fill that role, and by the end, everything is resolved, and they're able to grow come of age Most coming of age movies way. don't end in a perfect resolution and that's what you didn't like about this one <laughs> yes so you just admitted it okay whatever we'll go on to this one and we're, it's very a little bit of juxtaposition here this one is intensely realistic it gave me ptsd flashback to what it's like to be in eighth grade this is like almost exactly the life i lived in eighth grade what is this movie it's eighth grade by bo burnham have you seen this movie? No, I don't like Bo Burnham. It's, it has nothing to do with Bo Burnham. It's not his style of comedy. It is a coming-of-age film. And you know what happens? She has one parent left that she doesn't get along really well with. She has a rough time at school, except she doesn't really have that many friends. It follows almost the same vague storyline of The Edge of Seventeen. She even has a teacher that helps her out, that type of thing. Except she has a rough time with students and with having friends and like growing up in modern society which is the difference what i think is really good about this movie is it's realistic this is like if you haven't seen it, it's like exactly you literally just described a movie that's almost identical to the edge of 17 and then you said but this one's realistic the edge of 17 I'm gonna, was realistic I'm gonna explain to you why it's realistic because it explains in the movie it's the girl she's like uh whatever like 12 or 13 she's trying to make her own youtube channel and it's so cringy the entire movie is so cringy it gives me flashbacks that makes it real She's on social media. It shows, like, her being on her phone. It shows how that affects her relationships with people. It shows how that people treat differently, treat her differently, and how people interact with different people differently. It shows how technology has changed modern-day society. Because as far as um, coming-of-age films go, I'm not opposed to them. I don't hate them, like, initially. I like most of these movies. I didn't hate the The Edge of Seventeen. I liked it. But the difference is, bless you. Thank you. The other ones feel... Uh, stereotypical or forced, as if someone is trying to tell me what it's like to be in high school. This one isn't trying to tell me what it's like to be in third grade. Or, uh, sorry, eighth grade? Sorry, to be in eighth grade, it's showing me what it was like for me, which for other people that had a different experience, it wouldn't be the same. You know what I mean? So the difference between this one and the other ones is I can relate to it more, whereas the other ones are kind of painting a picture that I really didn't see as much, so the storyline is a little bit lost on me when I don't relate to the characters as much. Especially because the lead character in here is really awkward, cringy, and quiet. What was I in grade 8? Awkward, cringy, and quiet. So it's re- like really someone that I kind of empathize with. So the connection for me is more there in 8th grade than it is with these other movies. I, I like these other movies a lot, but 
it's just lacking that like sense of connection that eighth grade has. I do me, agree you know? with you that for coming of age movies to be as powerful as they are, they have to connect and be realistic. Like they yeah. have to leave you with something, and you have to relate to at least one and character or at least a situation in the movie. I think perhaps I'll appreciate more coming of age movies like when I'm older. Whereas right now, I feel like they're trying to tell me what being in high school is like, what growing up is like, and I'm like, oh, it's the age not of like seventeen that. isn't. The age of seventeen is no. I didn't say the age of seventeen. Course. Stop. I didn't say the age of seventeen. I don't feel that way about the age of seventeen. I just mean in general, the generic coming of age films, like the generic ones. But then once I've got, got, gotten older, maybe I'll look back and be like, oh yeah, some of that does remind me of what high school is like. Oh yeah, the, the the good old days or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, I'm gonna butt in though and say I think that if it is a good coming of age film, it should relate to you at this point. It should like speak to you. I'm like, thinking about what your school. favorite coming yeah. of age film was, and it was it was like exactly it where you exactly were in your my life situation. at that point. Like, well, it wasn't. It wasn't exactly. Well, it was nowhere near no, no, exactly. Okay. No, no, but it, it was, was the, the same, same time, like at that same timeline and same like relationship dynamics almost. Do you want to talk about that one next? Because we're on the topic. Yeah, we can go to that. Okay, so we're talking about Lady Bird, twenty eighteen. Twenty eighteen. Oh, yeah. Greta Gerwig's Lady Bird, this starring Saoirse Katie... Ronan and Timothy Chalamet. Favorite movie of all time. It's right? so good. Yeah, she loves yeah. it. All right, go ahead, Katie. So, lead us into this. Th- just Tell explain us. what why it was you, about. Yeah, and why you love this movie. First, summarize the plot. Um. So, I don't know. What's the main <laughs> character's name? Lady Bird. <laughs> oh, I guess they just her. <laughs> no, but what's her? Oh, her real name. Yeah. Who knows? Call oh, her Lady God. Bird. Oh God, yeah, I can't remember okay, what well, her real name was. She she comes up with like a fake name, Lady Bird, that she has everybody call her by. But she's like, uh, she's in grade twelve, and she has to apply for university, and she she sort of has like a strained relationship with her mom, and she's really close to her dad, and um, they sort of just go through like her last year, and then like when she at the end she like goes off to university, and it's sort of, I don't know. It's just mostly about her grade 12 year. I think the main point in this movie, the storyline isn't as much about her, like, doing what, like, what's she going to do next year. It's not about that aspect or what's she going to do with her life. It's about the strain on the relationship with her and her mom. It mm-hmm. is. It's very much about her and her it's mom. It's about her, her mom kind of trying to control what she's doing. And mm-hmm. she's at that edge where she's about to be independent and she just wants mm-hmm. to get away from her mom. And her dad is very easygoing. There's other kind of issues peppered in there, like, you know, relationships with friends or with boys or money and career and that type of thing. But, mm-hmm. like, Katie really sympathized with this because she was in grade 12 when I she saw this movie. Was. And <laughs> you're very close with our mom. Mm-hmm. Right? So this really kind of... I don't think she listens. <laughs> she doesn't listen. She doesn't Ouch. listen. Ouch. Um... <laughs> so it really kind of do you want to talk about it or do you want yeah, me to talk, talk about, about why it? you love this movie like, even it's not you i don't know it it was like the, uh, as opposed to most of the other ones i found it very realistic like you could tell between her and her mom like it wasn't like some sort of cringy where the mom just seems like evil and they just like they could be like oh they actually love each other but it's like very black and white like the mom's evil and the girl's like rebelling it's like mm-hmm. you can tell like they actually do love each other and the mom you can tell she's like trying to do what she thinks is best but they don't like line up all the time i don't know it just like it seems like an actual real two people like it seems like mm-hmm. you're just watching two people mm-hmm. like exist and Lori metcalf was fantastic who played the as mom. the mother yeah fantastic don't remember the character's name but the mom and then um we, we'll talk about the ending here quick spoiler but i mean this this movie's been out for over a year the ending, Katie, you were crying, crying in the theater. Balling at You're me. balling. Yeah. So, okay, this is a spoiler. If you want to miss it, skip ahead like a minute or two. Um, do you want me to explain the ending? Okay. Sure. So, Lady Bird decides to go away to university. They're in Sacramento, California. She decides to go to New York City, it, it yes. is, I believe. New York. So, she has to take a plane there. And on the car ride there, her and her mom get into a real nasty fight. This is like the climax of all of their fights. The mom goes to drop her off and basically just says, get out. Her real name was Christine, by the Christine, way. Oh, yeah. Christine, yeah. So Lady Bird just gets out and goes away to get onto a plane. And as the mom's driving away, she realizes, like, the gravity of what she's done. That her daughter is going across the country and she didn't do as much as say goodbye. Let alone, like, hug her or give her well wishes or even make an attempt to stay in contact or let her know that she loves her, is going to miss her and supports what she's doing. So she drives around and she start. it shows the mom as she's crying, realizing what she's doing. And then she pulls back up and she realizes that it's too late to, to say goodbye to her daughter. And that that was like the final nail in the coffin of their relationship. That the mom, she really loves Lady Bird, but she didn't get the opportunity to express it. And now 
that relationship has probably been torn apart like forever and they might not reconnect because Lady Bird is now angry at her mom halfway across the country left on a sour note that even if her mom tries to reconnect she'd be like you left me at the airport you didn't even say as much as goodbye that's not how it so. ends did she come back no she gets a note from her mom in the mail it's not and, the same though and then she calls them it ends on her right. call to her parents but still that's why that Where ending she's point... realized who she is and she accepts herself as christine and not Lady Bird. yeah but at that point that's where it is and then yeah it ends on like a good note but that's the point that Katie was really sobbing her eyes out because she was moving away from university, yeah. saying goodbye to our mom. It's very relatable. Like, but you were half an hour away. Yeah. <laughs> You're yes. half an hour away. And you're Come here home. now. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah. So, that one is a really good example of coming-of-age films being a lot more powerful when they relate to your experience directly. Mm-hmm. And it's probably something you're going to look back on with, like, nostalgia in that, right? Yeah that's it yeah okay pretty much yeah <laughs> it like, is it's I, a really good movie it is okay um i think it didn't get enough oscar credit that it should have gotten i really think it I should agree. it should have won mm. original screenplay yes it should have won original screenplay who won over it um let me check that but i really do believe that it should it have was won. it get good. out or something sorry or was that the year before i don't get think out? it was uh get out uh we'll, we'll check that but um mm-hmm. yeah it was it was really good and I mean, yeah, it was Saoirse Ronan, Timothy Chalamet, and now the, uh, what's the director's name again? Greta, Greta? Gerwig, who's doing Greta a Gerwig. remake of Little, uh, Women. Little Women. With... It was for Green Book, by the way, or original screen. Oh, I like Green Book. Yeah. So do I. It was, it was good writing. Um, okay, so we talked about Katie's favorite. Do we want to go on to your favorite now? No, that, that's the, the grand finale. That's the, okay. Grand finale. All right, there's what? one on here that, um, I, I guarantee you everyone listening to this has probably seen. And it's why we're going to talk about it, so, you know. Let's talk about Mean Girls. Let's talk about Mean Girls. Um, On Wednesdays, we wear pink. So, Mean Girls is maybe the most quoted film in high school. You know what I mean? When I think of... Yeah, it's quoted a lot between high schoolers, yeah. But I also think it's, like, nobody's favorite movie. No. No, But it's it's a fun, enjoyable movie. It's, like, really defined kind of our culture and references. (laughs) It's really iconic, but it's nobody's favorite. It's Amy Poehler it's and there. Tina Fey. Like, they do a great job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you like Mean Girls? I love Mean Girls. I like Mean Girls, too. How many Katie? times have you probably seen yeah, Mean I like Girls? Yeah, I've only seen it twice. You've seen it twice. Katie, how many times have you seen it? Uh, Probably more than twice. I don't know. Probably more than twice. I can tell you, I've had three different classes in high school that they've shown us Mean Girls. Yeah. I can't remember why. I only had one. But they've shown us Mean Girls. I don't know why. I Again, this is a movie that I think it doesn't represent what high school is like. It's Not a, at it's all. It's a gross exaggeration. Oh, yeah, it really is. Of course, like, none of, that, none of that shit's actually happening. But I think they do it the proper way, where they don't try and pass it off as this is what's actually happening. It's the comedy and all of this kind of ridiculous, over-the-top, exaggerated shit happening that really adds to the film. Whereas other coming-of-age movies that maybe they do exaggerate it, still try to pass it off as this is how it is. Or a show like Riverdale. Oh my god. (laughs) Riverdale is probably one of the worst representations of high school. Riverdale is the worst show on TV right now. (laughs) It's It's so funny. And they try and pass it off as being totally legitimate and believable. Not like a line. You ever see the cast in an interview? They're like, yeah, They think it's it's a great show. No, they don't. uh, They do not. No, the cast of them do. interviews... Some of them do think it's a great show, and they think they're, like, the gift to the acting. The girl who plays Veronica was on Stephen Colbert a few weeks ago. Oh, she doesn't take it seriously, but yeah. Cole and Sprouse and the girl that plays Does Betty Cole Sprouse do. really take it yes. seriously? Oh, that breaks my heart. Cole, come on. Yeah. You're but, smarter than this. I mean, yeah, so it's it's one of those coming-of-age movies that everyone can kind of laugh at, and it does still have a lesson, you know, that be true to yourself. You don't want to kind of fall into the trap of being caught up by like vanity or more material things like that's the lesson being taught but in short it's a funny movie you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's a coming of age but it's also a comedy and i'd say a cult classic it is it's very yes. much a cult classic yeah um it's just honest it's a very enjoyable movie it's entertaining like, it's, it's fun. entertaining and even though it is grossly exaggerated there is still that lesson though about friendship and circles and just popularity in general like mm-hmm. how important is it really so those lessons they're still there and it's just it's done really well and of course there's the iconic christmas scene <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay if you don't know what i'm talking about just google mean girls christmas scene like I, you need to just watch this to experience it for the first time but it's absolutely fabulous mm-hmm. mean girls definitely something that if you haven't watched it you you'll end up watching it in your life like you just have yeah. to 
Okay. Moving so, on. Okay, this is the part now where my positive attitude is going to drop off a little bit, Ava. And we, I think we your dis- positive attitude is going to come up. We disagree on this movie. We do. This is the best coming-of-age movie I have watched this um, movie's in a, load a long of shit. time. I think it's maybe... Uh, I have it might not seen it. be my favorite coming-of-age movie when I think about it. It might be. Because it registers as more than a coming-of-age movie. I see it as a drama, and it's very telling of today's society. It's not something I can relate to particularly, so... What are we talking about? Uh, Moonlight. 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 You want to start or you want me to start? So... Oh, why don't you start? You can explain the movie. All right. Are you comfortable doing that? Don't Moonlight be negative about it. Took a film, took the story of a young um, black boy who grew up without a father. His mother was, was she a prostitute, right? Um, not necessarily, but she kind of did what she would do to get money. Yeah, she did what she did to get money. They lived poor. Grew up on the rough uh, side of town, kind of mm-hmm. whatever, to get money. Like, there's gang presence, violence, that type of thing. He had a father figure in a character played by Mahershala Ali, which we will talk about for the first act of the film. So each act of the film is him at a different age. So act one is him in, like, middle school. Mm -hmm. Act two is him in high school. And act three is him as an an adult. adult. And he also goes through, like, the journey of life and discovers that he's gay. There's a love interest. I mean, like, obviously, I don't know what it's like to be, like, a little gay black boy. But it's very conflicting growing up in this very macho society where there's gang presence and you have to be super manly all the time and then he realizes he's gay and it's 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 really shameful like it's really just not approved in in like the people he's surrounded by and the culture that he's grown up to so it's 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 just something he he can't tell anyone and he falls in love with this boy they have they they're on like a beach in the moonlight that's where it came from the water it's super beautiful i like the movie a lot what my turn sure this movie is a load of crap oh my god this movie beat out la la land an actual true piece of cinematic genius for best picture cinematic genius you use cinematic genius too often no i don't i really don't i think you get confused with movies that are your favorite and movies that they're cinematic geniuses are movies that are just good and your own opinions are like they're they can they're not the same thing la la land was cinematic genius you cannot convince la la land was good it's a beautiful modern day musical i wasn't crazy about when la la land came out when i was watching the oscars i was like la la land won i was expecting moonlight to win, and then they're like psych moonlight did win i'm like i knew it so right if you guys don't remember that little kerfuffle Moonlight? Moonlight was, in my opinion, it's not a good film. It's so it starts good. off. It starts off strong. It really does start off strong in the it first act. I loved strong. Mahershala Ali's character. Yeah, he's great. I hundred percent loved it. And then, like, you start to actually like really like these characters, grow attached to them. Can. And then the first, let me finish. Sorry, I'm, it's comments. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested. And then the first act finishes, and we move into the second act, and it's Isn't like what five ish years later, yeah. maybe seven. Um, yes. and it's suddenly Mahershala Ali's character is dead. He's gone. There's like no explanation. Said, oh, when he was here, like he's just gone it's implied that he died from gang violence that someone shot him he's gone you didn't pay attention to the movie i did pay attention to this the reason they did that is because it's to show how normalized like people being killed are it's meant to show that oh he's gone it's not well, it like, does that poorly it's a tear i'm how sorry you can't that? pick up on subtle hints that it's not like they'd be like oh yeah when he was shot by 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 like a rival gang member when he was shot. They don't even drunk. say he was shot by a rival gang member because it's implied. You're, it's, they wouldn't say that in real life. Someone wouldn't just be talking about the loss of their loved one. They wouldn't bring up like, oh yeah, when he was shot by so and so. It's supposed to be casual. It's supposed to be as if you are. But this is a movie. If I'm seeing a movie, I need you to provide me with information mm, necessary to no. understand the plot going forward. Yes, I don't need You're a movie. You're the person that video games like repeat. They're like. Oh, we should probably look on the rooftop like a million <laughs> times until you get to the rooftop. I don't then need, hear the reason why. I don't need a movie to explain stuff to me as if I'm stupid. It wouldn't be explained to you as stupid if they were just if they it, just mentioned that he was killed in gang violence. Just mention it. How would you don't mention- tiptoe around it? They didn't that, tiptoe around it. They it tiptoed around mentioned. it. That's how people talk. It was realistic. This movie. I mean, to my knowledge, I've never been in this situation, but it seemed realistic and genuine. The characters spoke like normal conversation. People didn't say what they meant. People wouldn't speak their mind all the time. And people would have kind of half conversations. They would interrupt people. Like, it's it's, it's actually realistic conversation. They used real dialogue and little speaking patterns. It's, it's just how people talk. I think 
in that sense, it was, it, it, you watched it more like a novel than you watched it like a book. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Yes. That you aren't shown everything. You're more getting someone's perspective on it. It's like if movies are in the third person, this movie, except for like how it's shot, it's told in the first person. That you're giving his experience directly, but not every part of his experience. Just the three important chunks to show you the journey he has made. And it shows how the stuff that happened to him in childhood, how that affected what happened to him in, in, in when he was in middle school, and how that into into high school and then as an adult the lasting effects that all these traumatic events have had and that these traumatic events are so commonplace that they're not talked about that it's something that genuinely affects like thousands of people that most people like the other people aren't aware about do you know what i'm saying yes i know what you're saying that's my case for this movie but it adds it adds kind of katie you can talk katie's motioning what do you want to say no, I, I haven't seen this movie. I, I was just chilling. Oh, okay. <laughs> that it's meant to show how someone's experience, how these traumatic events build into his character and how he's able to move past them, but how some things you can't move past. He can't move past the fact that he's gay. That's like, that's like the turning point. That's not the turning point, but that's like a stable in the story that he's gay and he had this experience with this boy and it's revisited in his adulthood that he has tried to suppress it. It is not revisited. Let me tell you what happens. Oh my God. Okay. okay. This movie, then God. he go, goes into high school, okay? Yep. And the whole entire, like, discovering that he's gay, the beach scene and everything, mm-hmm. was well done. Really yeah, good it was dialogue. beautiful. Here's my problem with it. Can okay. I give a legitimate? It is shot way too dark. Because it's in the dark. It is sh- Okay, because- I don't care if it's in the dark. I should be able to see what is happening. No. I can't see what's happening. It is shot That's- so dark. I don't mean it's in the dark literally. I mean it's in the dark figuratively that he's repressing it he's repressing it is that you're watching it through his memories as if you're him thinking back to the time that's why when you look at things if you want to do imagery at least let me see the imagery it's 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 not just straight imagery it's like when he's in middle school you only get the really important traumatic things you don't get as much oh happy times that you get the things a kid would actually remember in high school you get the things a kid would actually remember but still some things are shot uh darkly and sorry in dark lighting or hurriedly and rough because you don't always remember the things that happened. And again, it's only the really important things that happened. Whereas, as it goes more into the older high school and adulthood, you're shown the more mundane things, you know, that he would actually remember as the days go by. And then when he revisits the beach, it's light, it's lightly, brit- uh, sorry, it's brightly lit this time with blue lighting, right? Because now that he's revisiting it, he can think with a clear mind back to what happened. I think you just missed the symbolism and you just want an easy clean explains it all to you coming of age film not that they're bad but i think you missed the point of moonlight is that what was like his childhood was like shown to him through the moonlight is it was kind of kept in darkness and it's not no one else is going to acknowledge what happened to him it's up to him in his adulthood to like think back to what happened to him acknowledge that it happened take it out of like the darkness put it into the moonlight and kind of like you know what I mean? I think this movie was just executed really poorly. I think and it's not beautiful. Dialogue's amazing. The acting is phenomenal. Characterization is great. It's so beautiful. I, I didn't love like the, the cinematography. And like Besides Mahershala. Besides Mahershala. Like Mahershala was great. Okay, great. I don't agree with you on that one, but if that's where we are, I'm pretty set in my beliefs about this movie. I love it. I just want to summarize I think this. It's deep. That Go ahead. I perceive this movie very simply as a very strong first act. A second act that continues just to go strong but starts to lose itself mainly because it's so dark and I can't see what the heck is going on. And then this third act, which in my mind doesn't even flow nicely with the plot. Like, it's just, it's so different as a different tone. Which, yes, he's in a different state of his life. But literally, he's like, he's working out and then suddenly he's going over to this diner. He reunites with the guy. He had a gay experience once in his teens. And they're back at his house. And that's the end of the film. That's it. It's just... He over. Has, he has like they find himself. they finally reopen the door on something and they were gonna explore this because he hardly even explores when he sees them. It's just some really cringy dialogue. And then they agree to go it's back to the house. Thing. The door closes. It's the end. They were finally reopening something and gonna like resolve yeah. what was going on and nope. it just ended. Nope. It's been resolved that he has revisited and acknowledged that it happened to him. That there's someone with this shared experience with him because there really isn't anyone else that he can talk to that has the same experience. So now that he's back with someone. I think that's the perfect ending. I think if they kept it going a minute longer, that would have been a terrible ending. 
if they left it off on some weird note that, oh, are they in a relationship now? Oh, are they together now? What's going on? I think just the idea of him reconnecting with this That's with what this I'm man. thinking, though, still at the end of this movie. Okay, fine, but that's up to your interpretation. But if they left it later, more dialogue, then it's confusing. It's not. It would make more sense. Do you explain? Do you understand what I was saying earlier? That the childhood is the most entertaining because it only shows you the important parts. That's all he would remember. Teenage childhood is darkened and kind of mismatched or confusing because he's trying to suppress that. That is what he's trying to forget. That's shameful to him. Like, almost his entire teenagehood, like, chunk of his life. And the reason adulthood is so boring because it is right it just shows oh. <laughs> it just kind of shows like how his day-to-day life is i'm not gonna explain this movie to you i'm just gonna leave it i liked you it to explain I think... it i just okay. didn't perceive this movie the way that you did exactly so i'm not gonna explain how i perceived it to you okay i still think it la la land was robbed okay that la la land isn't a coming of age film stay on topic <laughs> okay so let's wrap this up do you, we want to talk about a few more because there's other important um... they're real the rest of them aren't that important well, I mean, what? Perks of Being a Wallflower is pretty huge. Okay, it's a very cute, nice coming of age cute. film. It's, it's Logan Lerman, Emma Watson. It's about mental health and all that, though. And who's it's really the third important. guy? Um, um, Ezra Miller. Thank is that you. His that's name? his name. Yes. I mean, there's other ones, right? You have Stand by Me, Rebel Without a Cause. Oh, those are good ones. There is a good ones. Those are classics. That's maybe there, where there's coming that, of age originated there's, from. There's that crap movie, Call Me by Your Name, the Peach Masturbation movie. Okay, well, you don't Fuck have that to movie. refer to it as that part of the movie. That movie was a bit weird, and I'd I think say that movie's getting a sequel. Bit of a pedophilia there. The age gap's pretty big. Um, super bad. <laughs> Funny. I love Super Bad. Again, that's like Mean Girls, where they take it to the extreme and they joke about it. Now we can talk about a few movies here leading up to the grand finale. So, Pretty in Pink and Sixteen Candles. I'm going to group Done them together. Done by the same director, Done John by the same Hughes. Director, John Hughes. Starring Molly Ringwald. Yeah, love Molly Ringwald. Love John Hughes. Both of them are really good, but I'm going to be honest. Genuinely, a little bit forgettable. I don't... Sixteen and Pretty in Pink? Yeah. They are. Yeah. They are 100% they forgettable. They are. And they're the generic mm-hmm. kind of coming of age films yeah. I was talking like, about. I that like were... to watch them, but they are they're It's just because they were mass produced mm-hmm. in like the eighties and nineties, all kind of the same for the most part. Same same lead girl, same even dynamics between characters. I can't even remember what happened in one movie versus the other. I know it's their sixteenth birthday in one and the other it's just like choose between two guys. That's all Loves I can a remember. Bitch, duck. Loves I a think bitch. I've seen both movies twice maybe three times for 16 candles and i still don't really like i don't know remember what happened so this is the danger with coming of age films that they were just mass produced to the point that the same tropes came back and uh, back Mm -hmm. again and again and again and that's why i think innovative coming of age films like eighth grade or moonlight i know you disagree with me but like those two movies are the movies i'm interested in because they're different and they offer me a perspective that i haven't been shown before in film you know I will give interesting pretty, and different. I'll give Pretty and Pink props for its very early depiction of feminism. Because Molly uh, Ringwald's character, yeah, she's very so. independent. She makes her own decisions, and she's not like forced into like a relationship that she shouldn't be in. Like she thinks for herself. The entire movie is about her choosing between two guys, though. No, I know it had the, the right... entire movie is about her wanting to go out with this guy, but her best friend is in love with her, and she's like, "That's not how I feel about you." And he's like, "Well, I'm nice to you, so you should be with me." I know, but it's not about like a woman not needing a man. It's about her making the right choice about a man you know what i mean like I, i'm saying it there is the feminist around. there is still the feminist undertones but it's not i think i think it was very big for its time and it did well yeah it, it did. sure it was 1986 sure yeah i agree um you know there's other ones we could do oh boys in the hood i like that one i haven't seen that one juno how do you feel with juno juno's okay I, I don't like ellen page that much what i don't like her that much. I, we're getting off topic here because we're kind of pushing off the grand finale but i love yeah can we page. just get to the grand finale my gosh we're 45 minutes uh, in. okay grand finale here we go Ladies what's your gentlemen. favorite coming of age film joe fuck you ava the breakfast club <laughs> wow i didn't know that okay uh, that's so interesting can I turn off your mic? Is there a way for me to do that? Okay, go, um, go on your spiel. The about Breakfast them. Club Breakfast is a beautifully crafted coming of age film. This movie takes kids that are all from they're all from different social groups or cliques as they call it. They're very different characters, but in the end, they're all the same. They're all going through tough times in their personal lives, and they're realizing what life is truly about. 
They're realizing what it's like to be a teenager. It's a great message that no matter who your friends are, what social groups you are, everybody is going through problems. Everyone has shit going on in their lives, and everybody needs people. And it also is just the thing, like, even though they will not be friends after this, they will not talk after this Saturday detention because they will go back to their groups and because popularity and just what other people think of you plays such a big role in people's lives, especially when you're a teenager. Okay, sure. Like, it, they were still there for each other and they helped each other. Even yeah. if it wasn't private. This movie is so beautifully done, so well written. The cast actually got really into their characters and helped write their characters' dialogue and, like, what they did. Like, they helped choreograph the movie with John Hughes. They were all very involved into it. It's so well done. It's a cult classic. You should watch it if you haven't. And it's just, to me, it's a real depiction of what it's like to be a teenager, and it teaches very important life lessons. It checks all the boxes, and it's very well done. Okay, so... I love The Breakfast I don't Club. hate this movie. I don't hate this movie... I like this movie. Do I love the movie as much as Joe? N- no. Not even close. Do I disagree with what some of what you just said? Yeah. You said this is an accurate representation of high school. Katie is shaking her no, head. Thumbs absolutely down. absolutely not. Clicks? Not okay. I don't know if clicks Not, not 100% accurate, but not even it, close. It, it's, no, it's accurate. It's exaggerated. Else. I think they could have maybe benefited from adding a bit more comedic value in there. I know there's a bit, but maybe a little bit more satire type thing. Clicks aren't as huge of a thing as people outside of high school think they are. I think they were a lot maybe bigger they back were in bigger the 80s and 90s. Back in the 80s, and now that everything is kind of like, you know, together, everyone has the same shared mm-hmm. experience with the internet and all that, that the popular kids, quote unquote, are usually friends with the quiet kids, quote unquote, the athletic ones, quote unquote, are also the nerds, quote unquote, as well as like the lesson that everyone's having problems everyone kind of can talk about it no one's having an easy time no one is happy with where they are in life type of thing we like people know that already i think it's a good movie but i don't think it's in my opinion it's not as deep as you think it is it is Ah, no it's not i think john hughes makes great movies that are enjoyable and have surface level lovable characters not deep i wasn't crazy about any of the characters either i think they were just Stereo- stereotypes like jacked up all the way but oh they have like they have one thing that sets them apart from their stereotype oh, okay so they're they're real people they're not the stereotypes because they have insert authentic personality trait. not to diss this movie because i know you have a breakfast club <laughs> tattoo as well the point though of that was just to show that just because they seem to be from these social groups they're actually like everybody else like everybody was so similar they were different but they were the same but i think like that's common knowledge i think yeah i gotta say like there was a part where at the end um when they're discussing like if they're going to be friends after maybe i'm the brian but i'm pretty sure everybody's like this they're like brian and um whatever the other girl allison allison they're like we would say hi to you guys in the hallways but the popular kids wouldn't say hi back like it's not like that like if you actually like hang out with somebody who are quote-unquote popular kids like you'd say hi and like be friendly to them in the hallways like that's not everyone's pretty friendly no one's like judgy just for the sake of being judgy maybe they make jokes at other people's expense but it's never like like you you if you talk to somebody from a different clique your friends are gonna like make fun of you and so you won't say hi like that's not really a thing (laughs) and the um maybe not now we need maybe not now in the 80s 80s. but i think it's it was still exaggerated and that's why as we've been saying this entire time the point of coming of age films are supposed to relate to you and your issue with kind of growing up and coming to the terms that like this is your life and this is how things are that's what coming i feel like you should relate though to the breakfast club in the fact that life is is confusing and everyone's going through something but that's every movie ever that's life i know that i know that life is confusing i know everyone has issues i know not to judge a book on its cover quote unquote i know that at the time the movie was different to people than it is to people now and why it's still important to people now is because of what it was back then. If that movie came out now, brand new, with today's stereotypes and with today's, whatever, like, commodities or characteristics, it would not be the same. Okay, but it wasn't but made for that time, though. It was made exactly. for the 80s. That's what I'm I, saying, and that's why I don't connect with it the same way. But even for the 80s, I gotta say, those, like, 
when they were talking to each other about their deepest things, none of those things actually broke their stereotypes. Like Brian saying that he was going to kill himself because he got a bad grade. That does not go against because his Because of the stereotype. pressure his parents put on him. Yeah, but that's, that's exactly the stereotype. what you would expect. That that's what you would stereotype. expect from somebody like that. And the the kid who's like degenerate and his, his father like abuses him. That's what exactly what you would guess his problem his is. His name is Bender. 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 That's exactly what you would say. You would expect yeah, he has, Bender. His father. <laughs> no, but you would say like, oh yeah, his father probably like abuses him. Like that's what you would guess without even no like none of it breaks the stereotype at it all f- like no part follows it. through with the stereotype with explaining with their problems it more explains the clicks and why people would do okay. that why do you know that way about do you business. notice though on how the I one like person the in the with the one person the, this is something i want to point out sure the one person in the film that doesn't see them though for those like the way you just described the stereotypes the one person who doesn't see them though like that is vernon vernon sees bender as an asshole he sees brian as a goody two shoes because he, he's an adult yes that's how the adults saw them in that time that's how their yeah. parents saw them we know that is the point we know that is the point Joe, that's a terrible we point. know that point we know that like oh adults view teenagers wrong that people that are kind of like outside of your group that they're like older they're posers they don't understand I know that's not that's like real an, life like at all. every movie ever you think that so many of these movies are like that because of the exactly club? that's what I'm saying it's important but that's why I don't enjoy it as much because I understand like the impact it had on the film industry but and like film tropes but because it's been overdone now I can appreciate what it did but it's not the same as it would be if it came out new if it came out new in 19 what was it 84 85 85 i'd maybe i'd be blown away maybe i'd be like i this is great i relate to people misjudging me or people not knowing that i'm this way for a reason for people judging me on the people i hang out with or this maybe then i would agree with it but now looking back it's like i've been saying coming of age movies people like them when they can relate to them i can't relate to this movie in any way Vernon is not realistic at all. Like, <laughs> Vernon is not realistic. If you go to, like, adults, they understand. Like, if you go to, like, any teacher in your school, and they won't see, like, oh, you're just a problem child. They'll be like, oh, they probably have problems at home. Like, they will guess. Like, they'll know you have I go to, like, issues. the school counselor crying, and they're like, you're a problem child. <laughs> yeah, Get they're out just of like, here. you're just, like, depressed It's also for no because like, they know society, something else. like, nowadays, whatever, has progressed further, so things are different, that back then people were more judgy or more just like quick to dismiss issues so that's why i'm saying the movie today it doesn't mean as much to me as it might have when i was back when if i was around back then so to me this movie doesn't mean a lot it's a good movie but it's not a great movie it didn't move me i wasn't thinking about it i don't love the characters i'm not like oh my god i feel for that character i wish i could just like give him a hug i don't not for any of the characters not even brian not even brian (sighs) Like, Brian is me. <laughs> Not all. I I, I relate to Brian the most, probably. <laughs> Brian's the only like nice one. TV. Brian's. Just, they're all like Brian's not nice people. Still, you can be like, oh, like they're good Brian's people. Nice, they're all just influenced. None of, none of the other ones I know are. Brian's a sweetheart. So I like Brian, but they not all a lot. Have a, they all have. He's too shallow. A redeeming moment. Ah, oh, Brian. It's, no, but you can so say like you can say that, but even though like even Vernon does see them like that, but they also kind of are like that. Like you can be like, yeah, he has problems home, but yeah, he's still like. He still should be held things. accountable for the yeah. bad things he's doing. He's still inflicting onto other people isn't the right thing to do. Instead of like seeking for help, he's still like acting out. So it would be different though if, like, at the end that I don't know if there was like some way to like like things are different after here that it has affected them. But instead of saying things haven't, and that way I think it's more of like it's not really- it's not well, like a coming of age film because it just kind of helps them discover things in themselves but it doesn't imply that anything would change to be fair it doesn't fully answer as to whether or not things would be different or the same at the end we just typically know that things they would be things would be the same because john hughes came out and said that like that's who these characters are but the movie does leave you on the question of what happens next for these kids yes there's not like there's like a bit of character growth but it's mostly just they're not growing as characters they're just telling more about themselves you know what i mean yeah. We just learned that they're in... exactly who we think they no, are. No, because they discover <laughs> new things about themselves and put everyone else around them, and they discover that everyone's going to shit and that they can get through their shit. There's so much character arc and so much character development mm. in this movie. This movie is nothing but characters and character development. I don't think so. Yeah, but the characters are just archetypes. Uh, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. I don't relate to it a lot. I don't... I think the characters are a bit... I know they're meant to be the stereotypes, but as Katie has said, <laughs> when they quote-unquote break the stereotypes they're just following more it's a good movie it's a great movie 
It's not one of my favorites. I know it's... Is it your favorite movie of all time? My favorite movie of yeah. all time. So I'm not Love dissing it. I'm just saying this is why it is not my favorite movie of all time. It. Oh, Katie's dissing it. That's a lot for her. Well, Katie's also recently single, so what does she know? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Say psych. Psych. Good. Okay. Thank you once again for joining us on an so, episode of 21st Century So, that's it. Cinema. That's where we're, en- that's where we're <laughs> ending it. A little bit um, of sour this- note. You know what, though? I feel like for them, it's great because they saw me talking about something positively and passionately. I think, and... But it was the wrong thing to be passionate about. You know what, Ava? <laughs> um, um, people, what they can be passionate about? It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I have to control what you like and dislike. If you disagree well, with me, you're straight up if, wrong. If you want to see more of this as a tease, I do know that our next episode in two weeks is Q&A. our Q&A with Noah Q&A. Schaefer returning. Noah Schaefer. Um, someone has submitted the question of, is The Breakfast Club overrated? Yes. Oh, 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 so excited to answer that question. You and Noah okay, can have a there. heyday with that. Oh, he's but, on my side. Um, for once, he's not replacing me. <laughs> Most. <laughs> I want to thank Katie so much for thank coming you, Katie. on. Thanks for having me. Even though so she gentle. her voice won't be heard again for a while, she will be right behind. Whoa, whoa. Why? We're not having her again? No, I mean, like, like we're not going to have her for, like, the next, like, Katie's not allowed to talk I'm losing ever. my voice oh, my. due to a tragic throat virus okay. for a bit, though, but it'll, it'll come back. I just was trying was, to say that even though she writing. won't be on the podcast, she'll be right like here. Beside if you guys us have questions producing. for Katie, you can ask them. You know, she she'll be here too. Why do you put up with Joe? Is going to be like the most common one. <laughs> I'll ask that one. I'll put that one in. <laughs> okay. If you guys want to ask us questions again, our Instagram is where we ask it for the most part. So that's just Twenty First Century Cinema, spelt out. Even if you don't want to ask us questions, give us a follow. Get updates on our episodes coming out. Just other things too, movie industry questions, polls, that type of thing. Um, if you want to ask us a question, it's not up on our Instagram story. You can DM us on Instagram. You can also give us episode ideas on Instagram. You can give us movie recommendations. You can DM us about anything, maybe like not personal problems, or whatever. Anything movie related or related to the podcast, ask us. If you don't have Instagram, that's great because we have a Twitter now. We do. We're at TFCC Podcast on Twitter. It's mainly a place for me to filter out my shitty opinions about movies, but I really encourage you to give it a follow. Yeah. And we also will <laughs> uh, retweet kind of stuff about the movie industry and the movies that we specifically I really got to get on doing that in. more. But yes, that's the so goal for it. So this is kind of a way to keep up with more of our <laughs> personal interests and takes mm-hmm. on movies, film industry, maybe a bit of television, that type of thing. Check us out on there. Again, if you want to support us, patreon.com slash tfcc doesn't hurt to check it out and uh we also have our personal instagrams a little bit of a shameless self plug here i am at ava Curvello. and i am at the one and only jdv with all underscores in between and as always if you're driving or just don't have time to remember right now it's in the <gasps> description of this episode that's so convenient whoever thought of that was really smart thank you yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so convenient. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, guys. Thank you. Join us in two weeks for Noah Schaefer's return. Join us after that for our Christmas episode. Christmas, oh man. And Christmas. then we'll take our hiatus over the break and be back in the new year. Whoa, 2020. We've 2020 got vision. Oscars coming up. We've got a very exciting adaptation episode coming up. And also... A whole the, new decade. Yeah, a whole new decade is going to start. But also, it's going to be our one-year anniversary. Oh my god. We're going to be One celebrating year. that. That's crazy. I know. So stay tuned for a lot more to come. We can't wait for it. Um. Yeah. Thank you. And Goodbye. We'll see you next time. Have a good one.